Hello and welcome back to uh, part two now of this exercise. So in part one, we went through a, a number of calculations and we calculated our point estimates of the intercept and the slope coefficient uh, for our estimated regression equation. So here we have the results of this. There's negative 14.4 plus 16, I think 16.6. Yeah, 16.6x. So uh, this described our point estimate of this relationship between our independent variable, the number of hours spent studying, and our dependent variable, uh, a student's grade. Now, the next thing that we're going to do in this uh, in this video is we'll go through the hypothesis testing uh, and the confidence interval estimates. So this is now a part uh, of this regression exercise that we should have some familiarity with because so much of what we've been doing throughout all of the preceding videos uh, has been hypothesis testing. So what we're doing now with this estimated regression equation, what we want to do is test this set of hypotheses. Do we have evidence to show that our parameters are statistically different from zero. Now, the most interesting one here is really to focus on whether or not the slope coefficient is different from zero. Think about what this means. If this is my estimated regression equation, so I have uh, y and I have x, if this slope coefficient is found to be not statistically different from zero, then basically what's that telling us is that y, our dependent variable, is not related to x. So whatever variable we've chosen, in this case, the number of hours uh, spent studying, uh, is not a predictor of student's grade. There's no relationship. So what we would hope to find is that when we perform this hypothesis test, we would hope to find that we, we have evidence to reject this null hypothesis so that we can, we can support the alternative that yes, that parameter is statistically different from zero, which means that that relationship does exist. There is a correlation uh, between number of hours spent studying and a grade. So that one is often the more interesting one. For the intercept, for it to be not statistically different from zero, in this case, all that means is that it passes through the origin, which means that if for example, students don't study at all, then that would imply that the average grade is zero if it were to pass through the origin. So what we'll do, we'll, we'll do both of the tests, but what's really more interesting here is uh, the test on the slope. So <clears throat> let's, let's get started. So what we need, we're going to be calculating a t-statistic and then the p-value. So the t-statistic for this test as every other t-test that we've done, it's always the point estimate divided by the standard error. That's how it's been for any t-test that we've done. In this case, our point estimate is bi, with our intercept or our slope estimate, divided by the standard error of bi. Now, we've calculated uh, those coefficients. We've calculated the numerator. <coughs> what we haven't calculated is the standard error of that coefficient. Now, we understand what that means because the standard error of the coefficient, it has the same general meaning as it's had for other t-tests that we've done. It gives us an idea of the distribution of those point estimates. Just as when we were calculating you know, the standard error about the mean, this gave us, remember way back in module nine, I think, this gave us that information pertaining to the distribution of sample means within a population. Well, here it's the same thing, except we're talking about this coefficient and how it's distributed. So the formula here, I'm gonna, we'll talk about it, but we actually don't need to use it. Because as you can see, we've been given our standard errors. But where did they come from? Well, they come from this formula, S divided by this variance in x uh, that we've already calculated. Uh, oh, and this is a square root of that variance in x. 
we've already calculated that denominator as part of our calculations for the slope coefficient. So remember we had the, all those tables and we calculated each component for the slope coefficient. We already had calculated that denominator. This s, this now comes from the standard error of the regression. This is actually what we will need to calculate. Not yet, but we'll get to it. This is going to be this standard error of the estimate here. And what that is, s is the square root of MSE, which you may find familiar if you've watched some of the problems in module 13, where we looked at the ANOVA exercises. That's going to be our square root of MSE. Well, I guess I can calculate it here, can't I? <laughs> we already have MSE. So we could calculate our standard error, but let's cross that bridge when we get there. We want to focus here on our hypothesis testing. So those values, we already have them, so we're not going to worry about them at this point. We'll get there. <coughs> so here we have now, uh, let's do our y-intercept. So our hypothesis is going to be for B0, and so our test statistic is that point estimate of B0 divided by the standard error. So here our t test, our t statistic, our point estimate is minus 14.4, our standard error is 19.85, I'm just taking this value out of here, and so our t statistic then is going to be uh, negative, whoops, <coughs> negative 0.7. So this ratio here is negative 0.7. So there's our test statistic for our y-intercept. Uh, for our slope coefficient, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, 16.6 .6 divided by its standard error, which we have down here is 4.74. And that t-statistic is going to be 3.5. Okay, so those calculations are relatively straightforward. And now we can go to our t-tables, as always, to obtain our p-value. Now, what is that t-distribution going to look like? What are the degrees of freedom? These are all coming from a t-distribution with n minus k degrees of freedom. k is the number of parameter estimates, so the number of coefficients that we're estimating. So the number of BIs. <clears throat> In this exercise we calculated a y-intercept and we calculated a slope, so k is equal to 2. So this is going to be uh, n minus k, n, well we have 5 observations, so this is going to be 5 minus 2, so this is a t-distribution with only three degrees of freedom. So that's the first one. We'll look for negative 0.7. We go to our t distribution with three degrees of freedom. So we're looking here. And I have a test statistic of negative 0.7. So negative 0.7, well that's going to be smaller. That's going to be smaller than our smallest value. So that means that our upper tail probability here is going to be 0.25. And this is a two-tailed test, so we would double this. And so this is going to give us a p-value of approximately 0.5. Okay, so again, because we're doing a two-tailed test, like all of the other two-tailed tests that we've done, this goes back maybe a little ways now, uh, we double those probabilities in order to get the appropriate p-value. So our p-value here, in this case, is going to be about 0.5, around 0.5. I guess I'm rounding it a little bit. Uh, it'll be something uh, maybe a little bit greater than 0.5. So in either case, if we perform all of our tests here at the 05 level of significance, any reasonable level of significance. Here we're not going to be able to reject that null hypothesis, meaning that that y-intercept, I don't have sufficient evidence to show that that is statistically different from zero. 
So that's fine. All that means is that our, our regression line, it runs through the origin. No, no big deal here. Let's do our uh, slope coefficient. So we have a t statistic of 3.5. So if we go to our t distribution again, same degrees of freedom, and we look for 3.5, well, we're somewhere out here in between these two values. And again, two-tailed test, multiply these by two, and so our p-value is going to be something between 0.04 and 0.02. If I multiply this, I get 0.02 multiply this, I get 0.04. So there's our p-value there. Let's come back to here, somewhere between, uh, well, all I need to know is that it's less than 0.04. And that gives us sufficient evidence to reject that null hypothesis. So that means that for the slope coefficient, I do have evidence to support the alternative hypothesis, meaning that it is statistically different from zero. So the average, or the number of hours spent studying, it is a valid predictor of a student's grade. There is a correlation uh, between those two variables. Okay, so there we've got our t statistics, we've got our p-values. Now we can get a confidence interval estimate uh, for that as well. So that confidence interval, the equation, it's going to look so familiar. It's the point estimate plus or minus critical value times, wouldn't you know it, times the standard error of that coefficient. So here we'll have for the intercept negative 14.4 plus or minus our critical value. So this is alpha by two. We have three degrees of freedom, 95%. So this is 0.025. So if we go to our t tables, 0.025. So that gives us a critical value here of 3.182. So oh, this gives us 3.182 times that standard error, 19.85. So here I'll get my calculator for this one. So this is going to be 14.4 negative plus 3.182 times 19.85. So my upper limit is 48.8. And our lower limit is 14.4 negative minus 3.182 times 19.85. So negative 77.6. Okay, so that's quite a big spread. And we can see in this interval estimate that we have a negative value, we have a positive value, and so what that means is at that level of confidence, zero is a distinct possibility. And so that's consistent with our findings in that in the hypothesis test. We were unable to reject the null hypotheses. We were unable to say at that level of confidence that the intercept is statistically different from zero. And here this confidence interval confirms it. Zero is a possibility. So at the 95% level of confidence, I cannot say it is anything uh, different from zero. Uh, let's do it now for the y-intercept. So we'll just change our ink here. So same formula. Our coefficient now is 16.6. .6. That critical value is not going to change, 3.182. And that standard error now is 4.74. So I'll grab our calculator again. So 16.6 .6 plus 3.182 times 474. And that gives me an upper limit of 3168. Let's call it 31.7. And the lower limit, 16.6 .6 minus. 3.182 times 4.74, oops, 4.74, there we go. So a lower limit of 1.5. So here I have 
an interval from one and a half to 31.7. So still quite a range, pretty volatile. That's partly because we have such a small sample size here, but they're all positive values. And so that, that corresponds again with our hypothesis test. We did have a p-value less than 0.05, less than our level of significance. So we, we did have evidence to show that it's statistically different from zero. And here, our, our confidence interval also confirms that. So that's it for our hypothesis testing and our interval estimates. Now, I just want to bring your attention to one implication of this uncertainty in these confidence interval estimates. Because especially, especially this interval estimate on the slope. Because think about what this means. If we are estimating a regression, or we are estimating a relationship, what we have here is a point estimate. So here's our point estimate with that. I guess this is negative, this should be below. That's okay. So this has a y-intercept of 14.4, negative 14.4, and a slope of 16.6. But now here we've just gone through and, and demonstrated that there's a great deal of uncertainty in this point estimate. And so what this means is that when I'm using this for estimation procedures, for estimation purposes, so if you give me some value for x, so here's some value for x bar, x star, I can put that into my my estimated regression equation, and I can predict some value for y. But think about the variation, the uncertainty in that slope coefficient. What if it's actually, in the population, what if it's actually closer to 1.5? Well, that means that it's going to maybe look something like this. Maybe it's a lot flatter than what we thought. Or maybe it's closer to 31.7, so maybe it's something like this. Maybe it's a lot steeper uh, than we are estimating. So again, this is just a point estimate. There could be a lot of variation. Now, those three lines will all cross through one point, and so that's fine. That makes my estimate here is unaffected by that. But what if I'm looking at some value x star out here? My point estimate coming from that red line, that would be y hat. But look at the uncertainty in that estimate. Depending on which end of that confidence interval, where is the true population mean, or the true population slope coefficient, well, there's a great deal of uncertainty now in that point estimate. Similarly, down here, if this is my, my x star of interest, again, that red line, that gives me a point estimate of y hat. But look at the uncertainty depending on the, the possible outcomes, uh, the range of possible outcomes uh, in that slope coefficient, there's a lot of uncertainty in that point estimate uh, of y hat. So that will become uh, more important. We'll come back and we'll touch on this uh, probably in the last video when we go through filling out our, our whole table and then we'll actually use our regression analysis for some prediction. But keep this in mind that in, in that, that y-intercept, and in that slope coefficient, there is definitely some uncertainty. So now when we talk about a point estimate, uh, it's a point estimate of a relationship. So it's a, it's, it's a point estimate of a line. And that line can, can pivot, it can change due to the uncertainty that exists in that, uh, in that coefficient. So here I'm babbling on long enough, so I think I'll leave it at that. We've got our coefficients. Now another 20 minutes later, we've got our tests and we've got our confidence intervals. Let's come back in another video, and I think we'll probably fairly quickly be able to put together our ANOVA and our regression statistics table. Okay, I hope that that was helpful. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.